common gut microbiome. Well, thanks, to Daniel, and the organizers for inviting me here. And I realize that I'm the man standing between you and lunch, and it's getting late. So I will try to be short. And if I'm getting over time, please signal me, uh, and I will try to even be shorter. Uh, so I'm what going to talk about is uh, drug-bacteria interaction landscape of human gut microbiome. Uh, just to give some background, I have a background in modeling, but today I'm not going to present uh, much of the modeling work. Uh, instead, I'm going to uh, try to play the, or, or try to bring analogy to Tycho Brahe, who was a Danish uh, astrologist who has been you know, looking into planetary motions. He was uh, one of the first ones who made very accurate maps of positions of the planets and their dynamics, which eventually enabled uh, basically the physical laws of motion that could be uh, that could be eventually realized. And I think uh, the reason why my lab moved from mostly computational work to now actually mostly experimental work is because at one point I realized that we are hitting the wall when we try to understand microbial communities. You know, we have reached the limit of how much we understand metabolism. In fact, actually, I don't have any longer illusion that the central metabolism is very well understood. I mean, we hit so many points even with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we don't realize what's going on. Uh, so we decided that we need more experimental systems, we need uh, more data. And this is part of the work that uh, my lab at the moment is doing. Uh, so the question that I'm going to talk about uh, among the various different we're addressing at the moment uh, is looking at the drug factor interactions uh, in the human gut microbiome. And this is really, really largely unknown. I mean, we can look into bacterial. Uh, people have been doing a lot of metagenomic studies, making correlative uh, analysis between, for example, how the obesity, diabetes, many different types of diseases are related to gut microbial composition, how diet can influence it, also some studies coming up how drugs can influence it. Uh, but these are mostly correlative studies and not uh, causative. Of course, there are some causative studies. Uh, and sometimes I like to make a joke, uh, sometimes in private, sometimes in public, there is almost a race now to relate everything to gut microbiome. You know, so eventually, well, uh, I will leave it on that. <laughs> uh, so the. Before I go to experimental results, and since I may run out of the time, uh, I would like to first hand acknowledge the people that have been working on this, uh, people in my lab, uh, of course, and the collaborators, especially Naso Stipas uh, and Pierre Borg, who are uh, group leaders also at EMBL, uh, Heidelberg, and uh, everything on the gut microbiome I'm going to talk about has been done in collaboration with them. Uh, so this is going to be my uh, only slide that's based on published work, and everything else that will come after would be unpublished work. Uh, this is just a motivation example. Uh, so there have been two nature papers uh, looking into the effect of type 2 diabetes on the gut microbial composition. You find a very big signatures uh, until it turns out that this signature that we have been observing is not uh, the signature of related to anything due to type 2 diabetes, but it is because of the metformin, which is the first line of the drug that people take as a as a treatment for type 2 diabetes. And since most of the people take it, there hasn't been enough statistical power to, or people even didn't think about it. So most of the, the changes in the microbiome that people associated with type 2 diabetes actually turn out that it was uh, metformin, right? Uh, this is just one example, and there are only a couple of other examples that exist. Uh, but how far this goes, nobody knows. So we decided that we should start some steps in direction. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, uh, this is going to be mostly all in vitro studies. Uh, so we need to grow this gut bacteria. So we need to grow them in a reliable, reproducible way, and ideally in a fashion that in a defined media. Uh, so we can actually go back in to see what these interactions are, uh, do molecular analysis, and so on. I will then talk about drug-bug interactions, uh, and then bug-drug interaction. If the time permits, I will also talk about bug-bug interactions. Uh, on media and the, and the bacterial resource, so we have now approximately 100 representative gut bacteria uh, that can grow in a defined uh, medium. Uh, I'm not going to the details, but basically these bacteria have been chosen so as to represent, let's say, healthy gut abundance into the healthy gut. We also added some known probiotics, pathogens. This is associated 
uh, bugs, also the bugs that have been known to associate with the drug uh, in effects and so on. Uh, we have been growing them into 15 defined out of this toner novel media that, was, that has not been described before and to four different rich media. Uh, and basically, on the phylogenetic side, we get quite high uh, coverage of the known diversity, approximately 75% of the known abundance uh, on the metabolic diversity, or at least the metabolic diversity as we know of today. Uh, we cover almost all of it. Okay, so this is the, let's say, the heat map summarizing uh, actually almost four years of work. So what we see is uh, different bacterial uh, species slash strains over here, different growth media, rich media, semi-defined, defined some even minimal media. Uh, and basically, the conclusion is that almost 85% of the species, they grow in minimal or defined uh, media. Uh, and most of the species were at least actually two different uh, defined media that we can grow. Uh, and of course, this has been actually in the beginning quite surprising for us. And we have been doing a lot of follow-ups, uh, you know, and then making sure that we don't have contamination, we don't have media follow, uh, kind of a media uh, contamination, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this actually has been quite clean. We have reproduced these results many, many uh, times now. And we also find, uh, just to give some highlights, because I don't have time to go through, through all the results, we find many novel mucine degraders. So actually, we actually just double the number of species that have been known uh, to colonize uh, or to utilize mucine. And this has large implications for uh, many diseases associated with the, with the intestines, because the colonization of the mucine and weakening of the intestinal barrier is one of the first steps uh, that gives to uh, leads to many diseases and also immune responses, et cetera. Uh, quite interesting, actually, we don't not only see what are the re metabolic requirements of different bacteria, we see actually quite substantial inhibitory effects of amino acids and short chain fatty acids in particular for, on many different bacteria. And this is actually has been a very good lesson, at least for us, because uh, when we think about growing difficult to grow bacteria, we always think about what's missing, and people tend to add, and we also tended to add, you know, what's missing, let's add extra amino acids, let's add this and this and this and this. Uh, but it turns out that actually inhibitory effects can be actually quite so important. So I think we should start not, think, not only thinking about what's missing, but also what's too much. And I think many times we don't get spaces growing because we just simply have too much of amino acids, for example, or short chain fatty acids. These inhibitory effects can be simply too strong. Uh, another message that we learned uh, was that phylogenetic distance is not always a good predictor. So we have observed two different strains of the same bacteria that can have very, very different uh, metabolic properties. They can prefer very different media. On here, you can see a genus level map. Actually, this is clustering based on their growth preferences on different media, and the color are different genuses. This orange genus, for example, is just simply spread all over. Right? So you can get actually these kind of differences at the level of species, sometimes also at the, uh, the level of strains. Uh, what, and simply because of this, and also that this kind of resource has not been available before, our ability to model this metabolism also has been limited. So if you, basically we took uh, around 50 different, uh, or at least all available uh, gut bacterial metabolic models we had uh, in hand and tried to see if they can just simply recapitulate this growth in defined media, only 8% of them could do this. Right? So it means that actually just from gene annotations, we cannot accurately predict what the metabolic capabilities of different species are. Uh, so. I hope you can appreciate the, the value of such a resource. And I think this is one of the first steps I think we need uh, to do for many different community systems before we can go and model uh, larger communities. Uh, some other, uh, of course, one of the things that the reason we started doing such resource because we want to move to, uh, to in vitro studies in a larger drug screens or even uh, the community. Uh, uh, studies. So another few interesting observations they had that there are some species actually they prefer defined media. Right? So you give them everything, they don't like it so much, and there are some species that grow only in defined media and show very, very poor growth in, in rich media. Right? So again, is the question of the, uh, of the inhibitory effects. Uh, and the bacteria that prefer defined media, actually we find that they're at least significantly more prevalent, right? seeing that they have this kind of a, a strategy that they can be in many different places, they just require, so they're basically uh, living off into, into niches where the, the resources are scarce. What's also interesting is that uh, relative growth in certain media uh, correlate very well into relative abundances uh, across different people. Okay? This is the chart over here. Of course, I'm not trying to say that this media are, media are anyway, by any means, representative of the gut environment. But this means that this media we can actually use for in vitro screening. So at least with the growth, relative growth rate differences, we can, to some extent, or the effects that come because of that can be to some extent tackled. And one of this media actually, there are many defined media that do this, and the MGAM is one of the, the rich media actually that also does it, or shows good correlation. OK, 
Okay, so moving on from the resource to looking into the drug bug interaction landscape. Uh, so what we have done is that we have screened 1,200 different drugs, basically. These are from the Preswick Library. These are all FDA-approved drug uh, compounds, and we have screened them against the 40 different representative bugs. Again, from the coming from the these are the subset of the 100 bugs that we have basically looked into, and of course this study will continue, and we'll hopefully we'll reach the whole 100 in one point. Uh, so all in all, we have tested 48,000 uh, drug strain pairs, and this has been done on all in biological triplicates and on, under anaerobic conditions. Basically, what you do is that you throw different uh, different drugs into different bacteria, and then basically you record the growth curves. Okay. Uh, again, yeah, many years of work summarized into one slide. Uh, what you see here, uh, I mean, it's, I don't have time to go into all the details, just want to like to present some highlights. Uh, so the first thing actually uh, that was quite, uh, uh, I don't have a proper word, quite uh, I'll say astonishing at least for me, uh, was that most of this, many of the human targeted drugs, in this case, uh, 20, almost 25% of them, they have extensive impact on the gut bacteria, so they inhibit gut bacteria. Of course, you can see that antibiotics do the job as well, but this is not surprising. They are made uh, to kill bacteria. Human drug, drugs actually are made to target humans. They have quite large impact uh, on gut bacteria. And this is actually a conservative estimate because we have done our screen on one concentration of the drug for across all board, uh, which is 20 micromolar. And if you look into estimates of the what's expected concentration concentration of the different drugs inside our gut, for example, metformin, the example I talked to over here, this is way above what we have tested, right? So if we, for many of number of drugs, actually we have now increased concentration and see what happens. Of course, as you can increase concentration, you see start seeing effects of many, many other uh, drugs hitting gut bacteria. Okay. Uh, another interesting observation is that the abundant commensals are actually more affected by the human targeted drugs, right? meaning uh, that the effects that are going to have on the human microbial community and the effects thereafter, side effects, uh, for example, or the effects, secondary effects on the other bacterial communities and eventually up to host are going to be quite large. Uh, and if you look into uh, the drug side effect, right? So if you look go into the drug side effect databases, look into side effects that human drugs or host targeted drugs have uh, on the host, or in this case humans. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that if you have the drugs that show a hit in our screen, meaning that these drugs are affecting commensal bacteria, uh, then they tend to show actually uh, side effects that are very similar that you see with antibiotics, right? So this is kind of an, uh, let's say, an indirect in vivo relevance of our screen that we would actually expect that if these drugs are affecting gut bacteria, this will also show side effects that are similar to antibiotics, which would also kill this bacteria, which we also observe. Now this raises a very interesting question is about need to rethink about antibiotic resistance. And when we think about the antibiotic resistance, of course we think about antibiotics, but I think now we need to also start thinking about non-antibiotic drugs, the human targeted drugs that can also lead to resistance. And here is in just one of the few examples that we're following up. So on this axis you see the number of antibacterial drugs with anticommensal activity, and then here you see the, the number of human targeted drugs with anticommensal activity. Here is the E. coli wild type over here. Now if you make the, the mutant of the tall C, which is one of the, the efflux forms of the E. coli, so it's the, one of the common mechanisms through which bacteria basically become resistant. They just pump out the drugs, they become resistant. And now if you take, make this E. coli mutant, it moves diagonally up, right? So it's not moving or like this over here. So if it becomes resistant to antibiotics, it's also becoming resistant uh, to human targeted drugs. Uh, so this we are done also with not only E. coli, some of other bacteria over here, and then we see that the many times the mechanisms that through which the, the bacteria can be resistant to host uh, to antibiotics also apply to the uh, to the mechanisms through which they can also be resistant to host targeted drugs, which will mean uh, that the vice versa also will be true. That if we are eating, let's say, a lot of certain drug that is affecting the commensal bacteria, which we don't know about, it can also lead to development of antibiotic resistance. Okay, uh, so moving on, I would, uh, from moving from drug bug interaction, I will move to bug drug interactions, meaning that so far we have looked into how drugs affect the growth of bacteria. Uh, what we're also doing, of course, on the smaller scale because of the analytical limitations, looking into how bacteria affect the drugs itself, right? How they're, uh, for example, metabolizing drugs. So we are looking into 19 drugs that have been selected on based on different criteria. Of course, the main criteria has been that we can analytically measure them. Is it into lab? This has to be the drugs that are orally taken and sufficiently sufficient quantity so that there is some chance that they will end up into our gut. 
Uh, just to mention that it's not necessary that you need to eat uh, the drug so that it en ends up into the gut uh, because of the uh, the hepatocirculatory system. Oh, because of the circulatory system, a lot of the drugs, even if you inject them, would end up uh, into the gut as well. Okay. And so we have in total around 19 drugs uh, that cover many different classes. I mean, we have not put any chemistry filter on it, right? Basically selected. Uh, try to diversify whenever we can, so have many different uh, chemistries, many different therapy targets, etc. Okay, uh, the screen again is conceptually uh, very simple. You grow the bacteria with the drug. Uh, you measure the drug concentration in the beginning, and you see at the end whether the drug concentration has decreased or not. Uh, so one of the main conclusions, again, it was quite surprising, at least for me, uh, that many of the drugs are affected or affected by bacteria. I use the word affected at the moment, and it will clarify in a few slides why I don't say they're metabolized by the bacteria. Uh, but many of the drugs are affected by, by bacteria. Uh, I don't actually now recall all the numbers, but I think 12 out of the, of the 19 drugs actually we look into, uh, their concentration is reducing the medium bacterium. This also has been quite a bit surprising for me, because if you look into literature, the number of known interaction that have been described uh, are quite few, and ours is a quite actually relatively small screen. Uh, so just to extrapolate, which uh, I should not do, but if I would increase the screen, I would expect similar heat rate uh, across the board. Okay. Uh, if you look at the types of bacteria that are doing it, these are, I mean, uh, we again have been screening only with the 20 bacteria so far, but they have been selected for their diversity uh, in terms of types of functions uh, that they play in the gut ecology or their phylogenetic diversity. Uh, we see all types of bacteria, all the way from commensal uh, to potential pathogens to probiotic bacteria that are interacting uh, with these drugs in this fashion. Uh, so the reason I've been talking about affection and not metabolism uh, so far is because uh, at one point we realized that uh, there's what we are seeing partially is not only biotransformation, which is going to be enzymatic modification or let's say chemical modification of the drug, uh, but also uh, to some extent actually bioaccumulation. Uh, so what we have done basically is that now we do two different type of extraction protocols. One is, let's say, looking only into supernatant. Other is the hard extraction where we break the cells and again to a very hard solvent extraction to get everything of the drug that we can. And this way we can now distinguish between two different mechanisms. One uh, is the biotransformation or xenometabolism. Other is the uh, bioaccumulation. And this is the summary of the results over here. Uh, so what we are looking at is, is the different bacteria that we found, uh, some of at least showing one hit, uh, the depletion of the drugs that were here. And of course, in uh, the bonus readout that we have is also how the drugs affect the, the bacterial growth as well in the same screen. Uh, everything in the, the gray scale, this gray scale thing you see, these are our positive controls. These are the drugs that have been known to be metabolized by the gut bacteria from the before. You can actually easily see now they were, why they were known for even decades, because every bacteria you throw on them, they do the same biotransformation on them. So it has been one of the easy things to catch up. Everything that you see either black and green is some novel finding that has been not been described before. The black are the biotransformation hits, and the green are the bioaccumulation hits. Bioaccumulation meaning uh, that these drugs are being accumulated by the bacteria. They're taken up but not metabolized. Uh, surprisingly, we find very little overlap on the two sides, meaning that if the bacteria depleting the drugs are either bioaccumulating or biotransforming, uh, actually it's very rare. We found, I think, only four, case, four interaction cases where the growth of bacteria is affected. So in, in the most cases, the growth of bacteria, at least under uh, our assay condition, is completely uh, unchanged. Uh, since the bioaccumulation turned out to be so, pro so prevalent in our screen, and as, at least actually quite an underappreciated under mechanism uh, of the how drugs can be influenced by, or how bacteria can influence the drugs, we did some mechanistic follow-up for, for some drugs, and one of them is duloxetin, which, an anti, which is an antidepressant. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people take it in quite uh, in large quantities if you look at the, over the time uh, period of the the year, uh, or the time period of that people take this drug. So what we have done, managed to do, is to put a click chemistry tag on the drug over here, meaning that we can now pull it down with the biotin or streptavidin over here, and here is the pull down, as you can actually get quite clean pull down. If you do mass spec, then you can look at the enrichment of the which proteins are be basically binding drugs. So what we also done, I won't show the direct data, here is the metabolomics, also treat uh, of, the, uh, of the bacteria after treating them with the uh, 
uh, with the Tulog setting. Here is the summary map. So every line here in this cake style map you see is the enzyme that we pulled down. And the circles of the metabolites that actually are uh, differentially expressed in the bacteria after treating with duloxetine. And I, what I hope you can appreciate uh, is that they actually lay mostly in the proximity with each other, meaning that a lot of central carbometabolic enzymes actually binding duloxetine are leading to uh, metabolic perturbations inside the cell. Okay. That brings me to uh, kind of conclusions of at least this uh, part of the talk. Uh, so basically what I would like to convey the message is that we see really profound implications for, for the, drug uh, the drug discovery and the usage of our findings. Uh, and for the first part, we have very good resource for representative gut bacteria and growth media for in vitro studies. Uh, we see a lot of collateral damage, a substantial fraction of the human targeted drugs impact commensal gut bacteria. Uh, this, of course, has a relevance for drug side effects, uh, emergence of antibiotic resistance, drug repurposing, and also insight into drug mode of action. Uh, for example, especially for antipsychotic antidepressant. Uh, and it, uh, so many of these antipsychotics and antidepressants, which are also hit in our screen uh, on the both bug drug and drug bug side, uh, it actually doesn't, if you, when people start taking it, it doesn't work immediately. Sometimes it takes weeks and sometimes even months before you see the mode of action. And it's suspected the mode of action might be through the gut, and which is, has recently been actually shown for metformin case. So the metformin, if you inject, it doesn't work. You need to take it orally, and the gut microbiota plays an important role in the mode of action for this drug. Okay, and also uh, bioaccumulation seems to be a very widespread yet uh, underappreciated phenomena. And of course, it has a direct relevance for the, uh, for the drug efficacy in pharmacokinetics. And overall, of course, one can imagine that this would be quite relevant for drug design in general and also for personalized medicine. And if either I could stop here or I could have five minutes more, so to the... Oh, I have 15 more minutes, okay. Uh, I hope people are not too hungry then, by then, but okay, I will try to be, okay, I will try to feed you some drugs or, <laughs> hey, yeah, so moving from the single species to community, right, so what I've shown you so far, this is all single species work looking into, you know, one drug, one bacteria interaction, of course, you, these effects can be uh, quite complicated as soon as you can get emergent effects, higher order effects as soon as you move from single bacteria to communities. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that if you don't understand how single bacterial metabolism works or how a drug affects single bacteria, there is no way we are going to understand it, uh, the higher order levels. We need to map uh, these interactions. Uh, just to give a uh, kind of a flavor uh, for what we might expect to see, so even if you take a simple community uh, with five bacteria, that's actually the follow up from our, the drug bug screen. Uh, again, the duloxetine case, uh, the community effects can be very counterintuitive. So this is the case where your rectale, which is the, the red bar over here. Uh, so this is a five bacterial mixture. You grow them uh, as a community in a single shot either, or actually you can also get them into stable formation. You grow them without duloxetine or with duloxetine. Uh, so this red guy over here is actually, if you grow them alone with duloxetine, it's very sensitive to duloxetine. So duloxetine, duloxetine uh, basically inhibits this growth very, very strongly for this bacteria. Yet, in a community context, this bacterium actually is rescued by duloxetine. Right? Uh, and this basically happens because uh, the same mechanism I showed you before. So duloxetine, the bacteria that bioaccumulate duloxetine, their metabolism is shifted. They start secreting nucleotides and many other metabolites, which are actually beneficial uh, for this erectile over here. And that benefit that comes from metabolic crossfitting is it basically masks the duloxetine effect. Yep. So this means that the community effects actually can uh, be counted in situ, and you can actually understand them based on the, the, uh, the single bacterial study we have done before. Uh, this is, of course, a small community and not representative of the gut environment. Uh, so one of the other uh, resources that we're building now, uh, like we have the, the bacterial resource for the single bacteria. Yeah, this question. Uh, in this case, uh, I don't know the top of my head. We have measured them. Yeah. Uh, but total biomass, I don't expect it to change because the duloxetine is not reducing growth so much for the other bacteria, mostly for, for the erectile. Yeah, and this is not the most dominant one. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm, what I'm showing is the relative abundance. So this is not uh, the total biomass. And also, measuring total biomass is not so easy with gut bacteria. Many of them, you know, the flocculate cluster together. So OD is, I mean, is a very rough approximation. I think what we need to do either look into the total CO2 produce, or basically just measure the, the dry silhouette. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so like we have the single vector resource, we also want to build a community resource that we can use uh, studies like I've just shown in the slide before. Uh, the first, uh, so this actually, uh, I forgot the name, Alvaro Sanchez did a very good job in introducing type of experiments we are doing. Basically, you start with the community, you basically get them into particular media, and then you basically keep the transferring every 48 hours. Exactly same experiment, the difference being, uh, this is, of course, the gut bacterial community and run under anaerobic conditions, and this is the initial mixture is known, right? So we put this bacteria together, so we know exactly where we start, we know exactly who is there, and so we can really reliably follow, so we don't have the problems uh, with, the, with the phylogenetic assignment over here, and we know how each of these bacteria grows in this, uh, in this, in this particular media very well. Uh, actually, it was quite interesting to see uh, that we get a very rapid assembly. So this is basically the number of transfers. Each transfer is after 48 hours. You get exactly the same, uh, same result if you do transfer after 24 hours. Uh, we do it 48 hours because it's, well, let's say, experimentally uh, more convenient uh, to do. Uh, so basically, you get establishment of very diverse subcommunity in both media. As you can appreciate, there is no competitive exclusion, meaning that there is no one winner of the system. Uh, you get actually a mixture of the bacteria we have, indicating that there is either a strong niche partitioning and or there is also metabolic or other kind of uh, niche creation going on in the system. Uh, we have, of course, done this now on a much larger scale. So we are starting with three different uh, bacterial mixtures. So they are either we exclude, for example, probiotics or pathogens, or we mix all of them together. We have 15 different uh, growth media, defined growth media, which are exactly the same that I showed you uh, in the resource uh, slide earlier, and two different pH just, uh, just to test how the pH would affect uh, the system, so 7 and 5.5. .5. So 5.5 .5 is closer to what you would expect into right after the, uh, after the, or, uh, the stuff comes out from the... Uh, uh, from the stomach. Uh, we do nine transfer. We know that four and uh, three transfer are also sufficient. Just do nine transfer just to be sure. Uh, and we do the barcode sequencing at the end. Okay. Uh, so we get a range of defined communities, a snapshot of it uh, at very, very different diversity. You get as few as four or five bacteria. You get up to 20 bacteria uh, into the system. It's just a PCA plot. I mean, I don't want you to read through this. I mean, it doesn't mean anything unless you look closely into it. But this is basically just means uh, that these are assemblies are media dependent. Different media are good, uh, different assemblies as one would expect. Uh, what's interesting here is that you get lots of winners and losers. Uh, so I mentioned that we also characterize in depth all these bacteria and the, the same growth media uh, before. Uh, what you can now do is that two comparisons like this for particular media, look into monoculture growth rank, and then we see the abundance rank into community, how they do, right? So you can, and then the winners are the one basically which grow very poorly in the same media uh, when they're growing alone, but in a community context, they grow very, very well, right? And the losers are the one, uh, for example, E. coli often turns out to be the loser. Uh, when you grow E. coli alone, it's one of the best growth, you know, it's just, you know, uh, by far the easiest to grow, and, and the, the best growth in across almost all the media that we look into, uh, it basically uh, quite strongly loses out in, in the many different uh, media conditions. So you can now, if you make statistics of who is winning often, for example, Lactobacillus paracase or Clostridium ramosum are winning under many of different conditions, uh, Igotola lenta or these guys over here actually are losing out in many different conditions you look into. So you can start now looking into who is winning from being in the community, who is losing out into the the community. Uh, how to understand this? So if, uh, I don't have, again, uh, uh, time to go through the details, but what we are doing now is, again, the condition media type of experiments that you grow species one, then you add, uh, take the condition media and the grow other species. You get very interesting results, just a snapshot. These are different species. These are commensals. This is an opportunistic pathogen. Uh, in this media, it doesn't grow alone at all. It's right? very barely detectable in the growth. Use a condition media of a, of a commensal bacteria, and then it uh, starts growing over here. Uh, so the goal basically is going to be uh, the, the reconstruct the metabolic interaction map, the human gut bacteria. This is computer simulation purely. Uh, this is for the fun of it because we can do it. <laughs> we can simulate almost 100 bacteria together, take their genome scale models, and and simulate every possible metabolic interaction that can grow between them. Basically, you keep your supercomputer busy for as long as your institute would allow it. Uh, you can start mapping into possible interaction landscape like this, and the goal basically is going to be see uh, how many of this turns out to be true in our experimental setup. And with this, actually, uh, 
this is that ends my all everything about gut microbiota. I realized that a lot of I mean uh, I came in only today, uh, which actually is a pity, but uh, had many family constraints, uh, so I couldn't attend the talks before. Uh, but I realized that uh, the niche generation and the cooperation mutualism seems to be quite strong interest in this in this audience. Uh, so either I can stop here or I have a few slides on the niche generation uh, that's a map through metabolomics analysis. So uh, I think. Stop or continue? continue. Ah, ah, continue. Okay. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so technically, I still have 10 minutes. So, uh, so this is the work entirely or done by Olga Ponomarova, uh, who was a PhD student with me and is being continued by Natalia, a postdoc in the lab. Uh, so, we're interested in metabolic cross feeding, uh, especially the question of niche generation uh, and mutualism. I mean, I don't need to convince you, these are interesting uh, questions to look into. And the, the reason so this whole project started with modeling, right? So we started doing modeling, you know, uh, we actually see quite interesting patterns. We started, when we started measuring metabolites, and even if I look into literature, so there are lots of lots of implications of metabolic cross-feeding. Very few examples where metabolites have actually been measured and shown going from one species to other species. These are hard experiments to do. I mean, you can look at the DNA, RNA, and you can say, okay, this DNA came from this species, this RNA came from this species, fine. You cannot do that with metabolite. A pyruvate, when it leaves a, is a cell, bacterial cell, fungal cell, once into the medium, this could belong to anyone, right? There is no way unless you do clever label experiments, which are also very difficult to do in a community context, uh, you can't do that. So uh, there's a reason why it's so difficult to do, and the Olga has been actually quite interested in, uh, in getting uh, at least one very good, well-mapped community. And what she has been looking into is uh, metabolic dependencies between yeast and lactic acid bacteria. Uh, why yeast and lactic acid bacteria? Uh, these are one of the, let's say, microbial uh, communities are actually, uh, they, they co-occur in many, many different environments, especially with food-associated environments. If you look into wine fermentations, kimchi, sourdough, kefir, cocoa fermentations, bread fermentations, everywhere, almost everywhere you would naturally find Saccharomyces cerevisiae or some other yeast. Almost always you'll also find uh, lactic acid bacteria. So Olga has been puzzled by this. There must be something going on. Uh, uh, so again, this is a summary of a lot of different work, uh, but basically uh, we managed to make models. Model predicted that there must be some uh, amino acid exchange between this community. Uh, and we have done together with Uwe Zauer and Markus Ralser. Uwe Zauer from ETH Zurich and Markus Ralser from Cambridge. A lot of extensive metabolomics uh, experiment. The idea has been, again, doing a conditioned media experiment. Uh, uh, just to give a flavor, so we have a media, or actually many different media, where uh, Lactic acid bacteria do not grow alone, right? So you put them into, uh, they grow only in presence of yeast. You can also do in conditioned media, you grow yeast, remove yeast, add lactic acid bacteria, then they grow. Suggesting there is a flow of metabolites or some diffusible factor uh, from yeast to lactic acid bacteria. Uh, and if you do take now basically the samples uh, during the yeast culture and then lactic acid bacteria culture, which is after you remove the yeast, basically you know, what we are hunting for in the mass spec is the, the ions that show this bell-shaped profile. So this would imply that basically the metabolites that are secreted by yeast and taken up uh, by lactic acid bacteria. These are the results of untargeted mass spec profiling. You see very, very interesting profiles, but the red ones actually are the, the ones that we're looking for. There are lots of molecules, uh, and many of them actually are assigned to the amino acids that we predict by the model are basically uh, exchanged between yeast and lactic acid bacteria. Uh, and just to, to drag your attention, that these are not only uh, so we have done uh, com complementation assays and so on and so forth to basically prove we also done quantitative metabolomics and supplementation assay uh, in the same media, and we basically can reliably show uh, that these interactions are indeed uh, taking place. Okay, just uh, again, we have done also mutant screen, and here's some example of the, the four uh, different mutants that we find interesting. These two in mutants are that yeast mutants that increase the growth of lactic acid bacteria, two mutants that decrease the growth of lactic acid bacteria, or at least one of the two bacteria we test. And here is the quantity of amino acid secretion profiles, and you can see this perfectly mirrors the growth of lactic acid bacteria, meaning that you can also genetically manipulate your community uh, and show, uh, show what's happening over here. All these mutants are related to nitrogen catabolite repression, which I will come uh, in a second. Uh, and just to convince uh, ourselves that this is an active secretion, not cell death. Basically, uh, this was a month of sleepless nights, both for Olga and me, because we got troubled by the, the thought that there is no active secretion. Each cells are simply lysing. If you take different mutants, they lyse more, and then basically uh, there is no active secretion, but simply uh, not cooperation, but you know, cell death. Uh, 
Uh, now we have done many different experiments that show that this is not the case. Many lines of evidence. One is that if you would now make condition media of the different growth, prof uh, different growth along the growth curve of the yeast, they all show proportionate uh, secretion, and there is not much cell death going on over here. We can actually also take this different mutant I showed before that showed different degree uh, of the support to lactic acid bacteria. We have done the live dead staining, and basically, first of all, if you just calculate the number of deaths, we'll observe they are by, I mean, they are far, far away from explaining this lactic acid bacteria support that they degrade. And plus, that if you try to make correlations between how much support different mutant gives and the death rate, there is simply no correlation. This is indeed an active secretion uh, and not cell death. Yeah. Uh, yes, because I will come to it. Uh, yes, can, yeah. uh, there's active, I mean, again, I don't have the data here because we also done gene expression analysis, and uh, the germ gap one, this general amino acid permeates one expression is proportional to the amino acid that you secrete into the medium. So this is really dependent on it. And you can see in the mutants that are not secreting much gap one expression is also gone, gone down. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I mean, I don't have to go through all the experiments we have done. I think a lot of also looking into mutants, gene expression, metabolomics, et cetera. But this is a summary side, what we think is happening. Uh, what basically we are seeing is a niche generation in action. Right? So metabolic decisions of the yeast that are inhibiting lactic acid bacteria survival. And I use the word decisions uh, because they said this yeast actively makes. So here is the, the summary model from the work. So you have extracellular nitrogen sources, amino acids, ammonium, et cetera. Uh, so the, the uptake mechanisms are, you, are the same for all different, I mean, uptake mechanisms are not specific to amino acid. They are general permeases. The nitrogen basically comes in. Now, if at the same time, uh, if you start making synthesizing nitrogen inside or the amino acids inside, that can happen either because you're a mutant or you're the torsi, uh, torsi signaling pathways activated, for example, adding rapamycin. Uh, I forgot to mention that if you would add even slightest amount of rapamycin to your media, the growth of lactic acid bacteria boosted many, many fold, right, in the, in the wild type yeast culture. So you can manipulate by rapamycin. Then basically what you get is a nitrogen overflow because you have excess nitrogen coming in. First of all, yeast has all it needs, but then it starts to think either you have bad nitrogen source or some kind of other signaling. If it thinks that it's under nitrogen starvation, it starts also synthesizing amino acids inside. And this basically leads to a nitrogen overflow phenomena, and part of that can also be toxic because you can't simply just accumulate nitrogen inside, and this basically leads to amino acid secretion into the medium. And until for a while, actually, people have been thinking that Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a bad amino acid secretor. It's not a bad amino acid secretor. You just need to get it in the right conditions. It secretes actually a fairly good amount of amount of amino acids, and basically uh, this creates a niche for lactic acid bacteria. Now this interaction you can manipulate either by making mutant, for example, uh, that these two mutants I showed, or add rapamycin, you can get a lot more lactic acid bacteria, or you can make another mutant or actually change, uh, decrease it, or you can reduce the nitrogen sources into the medium, and this is actually quite proportionate. So if you would look at the how much amino acids are secreted at different nitrogen load, you can basically make a nice linear uh, curve to it. Uh, just a few thoughts on this. Uh and again, another evidence that this is an active decision of the yeast, because if you look at the which amino acids are being secreted, so these are the red ones over here, the amino acids that are secreted, and these are the biosynthetic costs of the of different amino acids. Only the cheap amino acids are secreted, right? So yeast is not secreting something that costs a lot to make. It secretes the cheap amino acids over here. Is this relevant into ecological context? We have looked into different yeast isolates that come either from the grapes, uh, or from, for example, from the kefir, and then you see whether they do the similar growth promotion for lactic acid bacteria. In that they do, this is our less laboratory's S90 lactic acid bacteria, oh, sorry, yeast, and this is the growth of lactic acid bacteria. So this has been the scale we have been looking up to now. And you can see, for example, Candida californica, kefir isolate, kill is a lot, lot more growth support, so they're actually secreting in acids. Uh, the same effect of the, the growth support you also see in grape juice experiments, so it doesn't need to be in the laboratory medium that we have designed. Uh, and we also done metabolomics uh, and the mutant analysis in the grape, just showing that this is, again, the same mechanism through which you see this impact on the, on the grape juice. Uh, and those who know about wine fermentations or the beer fermentations, lactic acid bacteria are actually quite notorious to contaminate this fermentation. Sometimes you want to have them for malolactic fermentation, uh, but they can also contaminate uh, quite heavily. And once you get them, actually, it's quite hard, uh, quite difficult to get rid of them. And you can see the reason for that. Yeast actually are creating niche for lactic acid bacteria over here. And of course, it has uh, 
uh, relevance for many other communities. Some of them were experimentally following up, uh, like Kefir, for example. Uh, but uh, I won't talk about that, and that brings me to my last slide. Uh, as a teaser, uh, now we have been looking into one-way interaction, right? And this is, of course, it's much harder to think ecologically. Why would each secret things? And we have actually quite convincingly shown that each is secreting things because it's profitable for each, right? It doesn't need a nitrogen. It has plenty of nitrogen. Accumulating more nitrogen is toxic. Since it secretes it, other bacteria can take up into it. Now, how that situation actually can be precursor for mutualism or, or cooperation, uh, depending on how we use the terminology. And in a very, very simple experiment, you can see this happens. It's simply you glu replace glucose by lactose, and then you choose a lactic acid bacteria strain that is lactose positive. And this is what you exactly get. So this is the lactic acid bacteria isolate from kefir, which is a milk drink. And this is the wild type fish. So these are all yeast at the same OD. And the dilution is on this axis. You can see now uh, the yeast grows only closer to lactic acid bacteria and vice versa. Right? And you see exactly the same into the liquid medium. Here's the monocultures versus co-cultures. Monocultures, you don't see almost no growth. Co-culture, you see both lactic acid bacteria and yeast grow. This is the glucose control. If you do the second experiment, glucose, yeast doesn't care about lactic acid bacteria. Yeast does its stuff. Lactic acid bacteria grow closer to the yeast, as we saw in the previous experiment. If you look into, again, we have done metabolomics. It just show the, the lactose consumption. Lactose is consumed only uh, into the co-culture. Okay, and with that, I would stop here. And again, once again, acknowledgement to all the people who have been into the lab, who have been worked into this, and the, the co and the collaborator labs as well. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.